Canonook Station, Frankston, Victoria, 11th of July, 1990. The train arrives at around 10.20pm and the passengers exit. As they walk across the bridge, a number of people hear a firm voice from a female saying, give me back my keys, coming from the nearby, poorly lit car park. One of the passengers looked over to where the voice was coming from, but the area was covered in bush and trees, obscuring the view in the dark. Moments later, an ear-piercing scream broke the silence of the night. The scream was then quickly cut off. The passenger looked again, but could still not see anyone. Unbeknown to the people there at the time, these screams were possibly the last cries for help of a 23-year-old Sarah McDermott. She has been missing for over 30 years. Welcome back to the second episode of our Frankston series here on Shadow Matter, where we delve into the tragic and horrifying events that plagued the suburb of Frankston, Victoria in the 80s and 90s. If you missed the first episode, a link will be provided in the description below. Before we get into this episode, I just want to put a few disclaimers ahead. First and foremost, I wish no disrespect to the families of any missing persons in any case, or to devalue their lives in any way. Myself being a family member of a missing person, I can understand what that entails when a loved one disappears. Nor is it my intention to demonize the area of Frankston in any way. I merely find these cases intriguing, that they all occurred in a relatively short frame of time from each other. Furthermore, if you have any information that could be relevant to helping solve this mystery, then I encourage you to get in contact with your local authorities. All sources of information will be linked in the description below. Sarah McDermott was born in Scotland on November the 15th, 1966, to parents Peter and Sheila McDermott. Sarah's birth was complicated, and she was born with pierre robin syndrome, which is a rare congenital birth defect characterized by an underdeveloped jaw, backward displacement of the tongue, and upper airway obstruction. Sarah was placed in an incubator for four months before her parents could bring her home. She was the oldest of two children, and her brother Alistair was also born with difficulties. Sarah was described as a small child for her age, but strong-willed, a fond lover of music and food, and her family would often joke about her love of the latter. The McDermott's originally moved to Australia in 1974 to settle in Queensland, but after four years, the family moved back to Scotland so that Peter McDermott could take over his father's yacht chartering business. The business venture turned out to not be successful, and the family wanted to emigrate back to Australia. However, it was decided that the family would wait until the children, Sarah and Alasdair, would finish high school before they moved back. Sarah's brother, Alasdair, describes their relationship as close during these years. As they relocated, they became each other's alternative to long-term friendships. The McDermott's family moved back to Australia in 1987, but this time to Victoria, and settled in the Melbourne suburb of Pascoe Vale. Sarah became quite depressed from the new move and was beginning to feel homesick, but this eventually changed for the better. The family later moved to the suburb of Frankston in January of 1990, and Sarah commuted to her job, working for a finance and insurance company in the city. She made a lot of friends there and was well liked by her colleagues. Sarah would keep in close contact with her friends back in the UK and send them letters. One letter in particular, Sarah would describe how excited she was for her new purchase, a red 1978 Honda Civic. Sarah would also describe how happy that she was that her friend was going to come and visit her in October of 1990. Unfortunately, the two friends would never meet again. Sarah gets out of bed and gets ready for work at Heath Underwriters, located in Collins Place in the Melbourne CBD. Sarah leaves her family residence on Sky Road, Frankston. Sarah boards the train from Cannonook Station. She has parked her car there. Sarah had plans to participate in an after-work tennis game with some friends and would later return to Cannonook Station that night to pick up her car. From 9am to 5pm, Sarah will be at work. 5.10pm, Sarah leaves the office with friends Gavin Thorne, Diana Wrightsmith and Mike Jarrett. 5.25, driving together in Jarrett's car, the friends arrive at the National Tennis Centre in Melbourne Park. 5.30 to 9pm, the group plays several sets of tennis and have drinks in the Tennis Centre lounge. 9.20 p.m. Thorne, McDermott and Wrightsmith walk to the Richmond Railway Station and board the train to Caulfield. 
9.39 p.m. The group transferred at Caulfield onto the Frankston train and board the third carriage, as this was the only carriage with lights on. 10.15 p.m. Thorne and Wrightsmith get off the train in Bond Beach, saying they will see McDermott on the train to work the following morning. 10.20 p.m. Sarah gets off the train at Cannonook Station and is seen by three witnesses walking to the poorly lit car park. 11 p.m. The McDermott's grow concerned when Sarah hasn't arrived home. Thursday, the 12th of July, 1990, 1 a.m. Brother Alasdair goes to Cannonook Station to wait for the last train at 1.15 a.m. Sarah is not on it. He finds her car in the car park. The doors and boot are locked. 9 a.m. Mother Sheila McDermott calls Sarah's work to see if she has arrived. She is told that Diane and Gavin caught the train home with her the previous evening. The McDermott's realize something has happened to Sarah. They call the police immediately. Detective Senior Constable Colin Clark drove to Cannonook Station and spotted Sarah's red Honda Civic and parked up next to it in the car park. Clark described that he saw a quantity of blood by the driver's side door of Sarah's car. The car appeared to still be locked with no signs of entry and the blood was still visible but soaked into the ground. Clark instantly began following a clear trail of blood droplets that led from the car into a small area of trees and bush, located on the western side of the car park. Further blood spots were found on the concrete gutter and grass, leading to the bushes. The dirt in the area looked recently disturbed, and Clark discovered what he believed to be two parallel drag marks isolated in the dirt. A green cigarette lighter was found on the dirt next to the drag marks. Later on, the forensics team investigated the scene of the crime and were able to confirm that the blood found at the crime scene did in fact belong to Sarah McDermott. This, along with the cigarette lighter, was confirmed as belonging to Sarah. What followed was an extensive 21-day air, sea and land search with over 250 police and volunteers involved to find Sarah. Given the circumstances of the crime scene, police suspected foul play. The media tirelessly pressed the public for any information that may be useful for the investigations. A few witnesses came forward with sightings of Sarah on the night of Wednesday the 11th of July, disembarking the train at Cannonook Station and heading to the car park. One witness, Maria Barbacala, came forward stating that she had got off the train at the same time as McDermott. Moments later, in a firm voice but not yelling, Maria heard a female saying, give me my car keys back and stop fooling around. Maria had looked back over the bridge that McDermott had crossed into the car park to see if she could see anything. But it was dark and the area was bushy, so there was no visibility. Within seconds, there was a sharp, piercing scream that was quickly cut off. Maria looked back again, but could not see anyone. Investigators came up with two possible theories regarding Sarah's disappearance. One involved the theory that Sarah may have been possibly injured herself and wandered off in a delusional state. This was ruled out because according to police, it wouldn't make sense for Sarah to walk off carrying her sports bag and tennis racket if she was hurt. Also, there was no blood trail leading away from the bush where the drag marks were. The other theory was that due to the area being industrial, it was proposed that she may have been attacked and dumped with her belongings into an industrial dumpster or rubbish skip. Police did search these, but unfortunately, this was done on Friday, almost 48 hours after she went missing, and some of those bins had already been collected. A number of witnesses came forward with sightings of suspicious looking characters, a man in a red jumper, a man on a bike, and a young woman in a long overcoat. Police were unsuccessful in tracking these people down. By May 2006, after nearly 16 years of the last sighting of Sarah, an inquest was held by coroner Ian West that found McDermott had met her death as a result of foul play, but the exact circumstances were unknown. So if it was indeed foul play, then who was responsible? Frankston during the early 90s held a bit of an undesirable reputation amongst the citizens of Melbourne. This would be further amplified by the media in 1993 when the Frankston serial killings would take place. Was Sarah McDermott an unfound victim? And this leads us to our first suspect. Paul Denyer was dubbed by the media as the Frankston serial killer. For a five-month period in 1993, Denyer 
aged 21, began to stalk and attack a number of women in and around the Melbourne suburb of Frankston. He tragically took the lives of three women, 18-year-old Elizabeth Stevens, 22-year-old Deborah Freem, and 17-year-old Natalie Russell. Daniel was charged with three murder counts and one of abduction. Psychologists and experts examined Denya, noting a lack of emotion regarding the crimes, the unusual randomness by which the victims were chosen, and a single-minded desire to kill, leading to a diagnosis of sadistic personality disorder, but not legal insanity. When arrested, police investigated whether Denya was involved with the disappearance of Sarah McDermott three years earlier. Denya murdered his victims in close proximity to where McDermott disappeared. Deborah Freem, living just minutes away from the Cannonook station. Investigators determined that Daniel was unlikely to be involved with the McDermott cold case, as his MO does not match up. Paul Daniel made no attempt to hide his victims, and although he confessed to the other three victims, he denies being involved with the McDermott disappearance. Daniel is currently serving three consecutive life sentences and is due for parole in 2023. In 2014, Police named the most recent suspect in the disappearance as cop killer Bendali Debs. Debs was jailed for life without parole for the murders of two police officers in 1998, Gary Silk and Rodney Miller. Debs has been dubbed by some as the worst criminal in Victoria and is also serving life terms for the murders of two sex workers in 1995, Melbourne teenager Christy Hardy and Sydney woman Donna Hicks after his DNA was linked with the cold cases after his initial arrest. Debs only appears to be a suspect in McDermott's case due to common practice for police to question newly convicted individuals about crimes that they might also be responsible for. McDermott's father wrote an open letter to Debs, begging him to confess if he had any information about his daughter. Debs did not reply and denies any involvement. Jody Jones was a prostitute that had been convicted and sentenced to 12 years in prison in 1985. She had killed a man with her stilettos when she had purposefully jumped off a wall onto the victim's chest. Jones had been released early and was not in prison at the time of Sarah McDermott's disappearance. Jody Jones had also been convicted of car theft, prostitution, burglary, and drug offenses. On July the 23rd, 1990, Jones was arrested and interviewed in connection with the disappearance after several friends came forward stating that she had confessed to murdering McDermott accompanied by two men. This corroborates several witness statements in which they saw three suspicious people at Cannonook Station on July the 11th, two men and one woman. Jones was overheard in a panic saying, you know that murder up at Cannonook Station? I was there with two other blokes and I'm worried because I don't know how staunch they are. Jody was apparently worried that one of the accomplices would go to the police and Jones believed that she was in big trouble. One witness recalls in a sworn statement to police that they saw Jones attacking McDermott. Quote, As the train pulled away, I saw Jody and these two males follow a girl who was dressed in sporting gear. I watched these people for a while and I saw Jody and the other two males start belting into that girl near the driver's side door of the car. I heard a female voice scream as she was being attacked. I then saw Jody come screaming out from behind the car and the two males were following her. Jody was hysterical and I ran towards her. I then saw blood on Jody's clothes. Jody was screaming, she's dead, she's dead. I have not seen Jody since this happened. End quote. Jody denies all this information, stating that she doesn't know why her friends would say such things. Jody was never charged with the crime and she died, aged 26, from a heroin overdose in a St Kilda motel room, just 14 months after the disappearance. With such little evidence and no body being recovered, not to mention one of the suspects being deceased, this becomes one of Victoria's most notorious cold cases. With what we do know, one can only theorise and speculate on the tragic case of Sarah McDermott. The crime appears to be most likely opportunistic in nature, with the intent on burglary rather than murder. It is likely that the perpetrators were after Sarah's car, and after Sarah fought back, she paid the ultimate price. With the attackers in a panic, their priorities switched from stealing a car to trying to dispose of the victim. And with Port Phillip Bay being close to the scene, 
It could be suggested that Sarah was disposed of there. If this is the case, there is little chance of a body being recovered. Jones seems like the most plausible suspect. She was a heavy drug user and was known for violence and stealing cars. But if her friend's confession was true, why did no witnesses hear Jones's hysterical screams? Also, surely someone would have heard the violent attacks, but no witnesses can corroborate this. There is also the possibility that McDermott was stalked and attacked when the killer seized the opportunity whilst she was alone in the car park. There is currently a $1 million reward for information leading to a conviction and the location of Sarah McDermott's remains. In 2010, on the 20th anniversary of McDermott's disappearance, her family and friends visited Cannonook Station to leave wreaths at a memorial plaque established there. The inscription on the plaque reads, Sarah McDermott, a dear adored daughter and sister tragically taken from this location on 11th of July, 1990. Loved always, never forgotten. Thanks for watching. This is part two of our Frankston series here on Shadow Matter. If you have any information regarding these crimes that could help solve this decades long mystery, then please get in contact with your local authorities or alternatively with Crime Stoppers. And if you'd like one of your comments to be mentioned here in the end section, leave a comment starting with Shadow Shoutout. And if you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to see more content like this. And don't forget to hit that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.